An attorney for one of the victims of the Idaho Four has now swapped teams and is now instead representing Brian Koberger. I brought in lawyer Christopher Melcher to try to help us make this make sense. Welcome to Popcorn Planet. I am Andy Signor. This case is getting wild. I don't understand how this happened. I have Steph the Alternate in studio. Hey, Steph. And we have lawyer Christopher Melcher here. How you doing, Christopher? Pretty good, Andy and Steph. Uh, yeah, happy to be uh, kind of breaking down this story. It's it's very, very concerning and just, just like you say, getting weirder and weirder. This is wild. So just so everyone's clear, I saw this. Uh, Brian Enton was reporting this. This actually broke through the Idaho Statesman. And yes, Koberger's attorney represented one of the parents uh, in the homicides before taking the case. Now, there's been a bunch of interviews. I want to play this quick clip here that Brian did over, or I guess Ashley did over in Banfield. Here's a quick snippet. You may not hear it, Christopher, but I'll sum it up for you in a second. But for the folks at home, here's what's happening. And, and I'd already given her power of attorney. I'd already signed over power of attorney so that she could help me with um, with getting into rehab and, and whatnot. And um, so, I mean, I, I, I don't understand what how she could do this. I don't understand what happens now. Does she still have power of attorney or, or what goes on now? And no one has reached out to you from the public defender's office to, to help you navigate next steps? No, no. Have you been in um, communication with the police and prosecutors about the next step in, in this process and where you might fit in? Uh, no, no. And do you want that? Do you want to be in communication with them to, to understand what's happening and um, and and what they're going to be doing as they move forward in prosecuting him? Oh, yeah, 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 yes. And, and I so she's saying that the lawyer has power of attorney, uh, had power of attorney, and now uh, has swapped the sides to go over to Brian Koberger and that no one from the public defender's office has reached out. This is attorney Ann Taylor, uh, chief of the county's public defender's office, uh, filed the withdrawal notice for the for the for the parent on January fifth, the same day Koberger made his first court appearance in Idaho. Parent previously was sentenced on unrelated misdemeanor charges. Um, so now, apparently, there, from what I, Banfield knows, are saying there would have needed to be some sort of form signed or something because of this clear uh, privacy issue, etc. Uh, we have more details we can go through, but Christopher, can you help try to make this make sense? Is this, is this as crazy as it sounds? Oh yeah, yeah, it's really bad, and um, and. And I, I understand why they're doing why the public defender is doing this, but it's it's violates her duty to her uh, former client. So let me just back up a little bit here. Um, so the mother of one of the victims had picked up um, some criminal cases in Idaho. And because she couldn't afford an attorney, a public defender was represented, uh, was appointed to represent her. And that was Ann Taylor. And it sounds like at least one of them is a drug case that's settled or resolved. And then there's also an active uh, case against her right now. So Ann Taylor is representing her. Um, and here's the thing is that an attorney owes a duty of loyalty to the client. And it doesn't matter whether you're being paid or whether you're doing it for free or whether you're court appointed. The duty is the same. And so it's a duty of undivided loyalty we have to put as lawyers the client's interest ahead of our own, and we cannot accept representation of another client when those clients' interests would conflict. So that's the duty that Ann Taylor had. And um, so she's representing the mom in these various cases, but then on January 5th, accepts the representation of Brian Koberg um, and is then goes into the arraignment there uh, as, as shown, Sean Koberger, sorry, and um, accepts this guy's representation. Now, at some point, realizes, oh, wow, okay, the guy that I'm representing, Brian, um, you know, murdered one of the, um, you know, the, the mother of, of, of one of these victims. And so, um, I'm sorry, that, that she was representing, Ann Taylor was yeah, representing yeah. The, the mother of one, one of the, the victims, victims' mothers, yeah. So um, so she realizes that now what she was supposed to do when she realized that is withdraw from both cases. And because now she's, you know, unwittingly um, representing two people who have potential conflict of interest. You can't have that. And she should have bailed from both cases. The potential for conflict of interest exists, even though the cases are unrelated. 
Brian's case has nothing to do with whatever mom's cases were. But what will happen is, is that if Brian's convicted, there'll be a sentencing hearing. Then um, mom would be able to give a statement uh, about why, what sentence she thinks is appropriate or her relationship with her daughter. Now, Ann Taylor knows a lot about mom and her criminal history or drug problems or whatever's going on there with mom and could potentially use that information to cross-examine mom at the sentencing hearing, which she absolutely cannot do because she has a duty of loyalty to mom. So that's where the potential conflict of interest comes in. She should have said, oops, my bad, didn't have no idea, you know, when I, rep when I did this hearing on January 5th for Brian that I represented mom of the victim. So my bad, I, I'm out of both cases, fine. And that would have been easy enough, but she didn't do that. What she did was unilaterally withdraw from mom's cases and filed two documents with the court without court's permission, without mom's permission, just saying, I'm not representing mom anymore. We're hooking her up with a private um, defense attorney paid by the county. That doesn't cut it. And um, now in a bigger county, we have like LA where I am, we have, you know, process for all this stuff. We have a public defender's office. And then when you have multi-defendant cases, we have an alternate public defender's office, which is a totally separate PD's office. And then we have an indigent criminal defense attorney panel, ICDA, that I used to be on, which is private attorneys that'll represent if there's a third defendant. So we got all this wired in LA, Idaho, you know, probably a nice place to live. It's not crime ridden like LA, so they don't have all these levels of defense attorneys. So she screwed up. She should have she should have withdrawn from both cases, didn't. And here's the reason why she didn't do it is that she's the only yeah. attorney <laughs> in Idaho, in northern Idaho, that's qualified to do a death penalty case. They haven't they haven't said whether they're going to do the death penalty yet, but assuming they will, this attorney would be qualified in northern Idaho to uh, defend uh, the attorney, you know, Brian in, as a public defender. Um, and so it's like, hey, I'm it. Well, that's that is not a reason to violate your duty of loyalty. They needed to go somewhere else in the county and, hey, it's going to cost them money. They're going to have to bring an, a qualified attorney from some other place in Idaho to defend this guy. And too bad, so sad. But we don't violate or change our duties to our clients based on uh, convenience. Now, th th this is wild. So to be clear, though, it says the, the public defender's office has represented the homicide's victims, this is the, the mother, off and on in several cases, court records showed. Since Taylor took over, her office defended the parent in four cases. Um, her office. Does that mean that Taylor herself maybe never met this mother and it was potentially a, just an error that the office did it and they didn't check their books? Like I, I, every time I've anytime I've ever called a lawyer, they get all your information to do a check, right? To like do background checks to ensure that none of their clients are in their database because then it is, becomes obviously a problem. But if could the office have done represented her and then this specific Ann Taylor never met her or heard any of this information? Yeah, that's possible. Um, you know, the mom was talking about Taylor. So, you know, kind of sounded like it was actually Taylor who had done the representation and not just the office. And um, and yes, they have a conflict checking system and they would do that. There's also one of the other parents had been represented oh, yeah, um, wow. by the public defender's office in another case. But, um, you know, look, we all have conflict systems, but, you know, here th it probably would not have shown up that easily on a conflict check because, you know, um, they're, they're not it's not a multi defendant case. The two cases are completely unrelated. Um, you know, this is a mom of a victim. So it's once removed. So it's not like, you know, PD's office is putting in, you know, like all relationships of their client into the conflict system. So I, I can like I say, I can understand when she showed up in court on January 5th and represented Brian, at, you know, but then realized some point in the last couple of weeks, like, ooh, um, either me or my office has represented mom. So that would take some time. So I say that's not intentional when she did the first initial representation. But then when she learned about it, that's right. when she screwed up. Then she's just like, oh, OK, here, I'll just fill out these forms and file them with the court. And I'm and I'm out of mom's case. And it's like brain fart. She wasn't thinking that through. Yeah. So what can they do? Like, what are the, what are the next steps to, like, fix this? I mean, at some point, I imagine as this is breaking today. 
this is going to become bigger headlines and people are going to realize this is super effed up and super conflict of interest if this case moves forward with her. She's, do you suspect she will eventually just have to step down? And then what does Idaho do if they have no other one there to represent? Do they hire outside of state? What's the future hold, do you think? Yeah, so she's going to have to step down is my guess. And the the thing is, is that um, that, you know, they want to secure a conviction against Brian. Uh, not not the defense attorney, obviously, but the prosecution and the state wants to secure a conviction against him that's going to withstand appeal. And so now this conflict has a baked in um, defense uh, for him, because if he's convicted, Brian would go to the appellate court and saying, look, you know, my attorney was not independent. Uh, I have a Sixth Amendment right in the U.S. Constitution to a court appointed attorney when I can't afford one that's conflict free. You guys gave me somebody with a conflict, so therefore my whole trial is infected. I need a redo. So there's no way that the prosecutor and the judge is going to let that stand. They're not going to invest, you know, huge Idaho dollars into prosecuting this guy and then to have it overturned on appeal. So whether she takes herself out, they're going to take her out. And right. And that, leaves, can, that, can that still yeah. affect, though, the trial moving forward, the early steps? Can you use that as an excuse or it's, it's still soon enough, early enough to solve this conflict? Yeah, it's early enough. The information that um, that Ann Taylor or the public defender's office have from the mother of the victim, I, I got to imagine, is too attenuated or not directly relevant to any of the crimes that Brian's being charged with. So it's not like, you know, it's a co co defendant. Uh, somebody was there at the scene, co participant, or something that, that the PD's office is representing, and that could create a much bigger problem. Um, but here, you know, again, it, the only reason in my mind why the conflict really exists is that a sentencing hearing, we're nowhere near that. So early stages of the case, I think it's no harm, no foul in terms of Brian's defense or Brian's rights to complain about it would be extremely minimal. And they can cure that by changing her out. And uh, according to the Idaho Statesman article, you know, she is the only attorney qualified to do these death penalty cases. And that's, you know, it's a very serious thing to get that level of experience to get qualified to do those cases. So big deal. They're going to have to just find somebody from some other part of Idaho. They're going to pay that. You know, the county's going to pay that person to come up and do the defense. And, and it's just too bad. But that's that's going to be the solution is is what I predict. Steph, you have a question before you wrap this? Yeah, so if Ann Taylor does move ahead, it goes to trial and she fully represents Brian Koberger. If it doesn't go Brian Koberger's way and he's found guilty on all charges, could he then technically appeal and say, well, I got the wrong type of representation, I was misrepresented because of this whole potential conflict of interest that Ann Taylor clearly has with the previous client of yeah. one of the victim's mothers. I did, interviews, right? I did interviews with them and they knew my intel. They could have easily used it against me. There's, there's no way for that to backfire. So he could still like, you know, if, if Ann Taylor steps aside right now and they bring in, you know, somebody else from Southern Idaho to represent him, sure, he can still make the argument, but um, I, he, he would have to create a record or provide evidence to show that, you know, there was an actual conflict, not just a potential, but that there was an actual conflict of interest, that information that uh, he shared uh, with Ann Taylor was passed along to the prosecution team, for example. And there's just no way that that, um, you know, it's early stage in the representation. The information that um, that Ann Taylor has about the representation of mom has nothing to do with the underlying criminal charges against Brian. So, sure, he can make an argument, but I don't think that that's going to hold any water. Fascinating. Appreciate your insight as always, guys. If you aren't following Christopher, go follow him over on Twitter at CA underscore divorce. For more updates, uh, we also have a really uh, big exclusives coming in regarding the Marilyn Manson case uh, with uh, Colonel Kurtz and more. You're not going to miss our live today at 2 p.m., so I hope to see you guys there or catch the replay if you're watching this later. Uh, always a pleasure to support Steph the Alternerd over on YouTube, Christopher Melcher over on Twitter. Thank you, sir, as always, and we will make sure to see you guys soon. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the bell for all alerts right there. You got to do it or you're not going to get them. Hit that all, smash that like, leave a comment. And make sure you get our expert commentary and insight here on Popcorn Planet. We'll see you guys in a minute.